Are we recording? All right, cool. All right, nice. All right. Okay, guys, so thank you so much for joining with us today. Um, you know, before, before we jump into the material, I just want to thank you guys for showing up. I know that uh, it's a big sacrifice to come here and everything, and uh, I know this stuff cannot always, is not always the most entertaining thing uh, to learn about, but it is uh, one of the most important things I think you guys will learn. And a lot of this material is going to be coming straight from the textbook that you see above. This was actually my textbook in the How to Interpret Scripture class. And uh, you can purchase this for about 30 bucks. You can get uh, an audit, you can get a... Uh, online ebook or you can order it online. I would get the second or third edition and uh, this is really going to take you through a lot more material um, and it's a really easy book to understand. There's a lot of fun stories. Really just I think it's a really fun read honestly for a how to interpret scripture book. Uh, I think it's really well done and so we're going to kind of do a crash course of some of the biggest topics in this book. We're not going to cover obviously everything but this I'm hoping that you'll use this class as more of a launch pad for your own studies because there really is, you know, like I said, this is usually a semester long class and you're going to get it in four days and f uh, four hours, I mean, four weeks. So, but before we jump into the, the material today, uh, one of the most important questions we can ask is what is meaning, right? And who controls it? Is it the author or is it the reader? If you read the Bible as just like, you know, merely for aesthetic value or just as like ancient literature, uh, then I guess you can kind of interpret it however you want, right? But if you treat it as God's communication from God to you, then your main question should, should never be, what does this text mean to me? It should, it should be, what does this text mean, right? What, what was God or the author meaning when they penned these words, right? Because Paul or, or uh, Jesus, they had a point, right, whenever they were speaking. They weren't just speaking and thinking, well, in 2,000 years, people can take this and just go whatever direction they want, right? They had a point that they were trying to get across. And so some good questions to always ask. A good, I think it's, it's an acronym. I can't always forget what, but when, uh, is AIM, author's intended meaning. That's a good one to remember is always when you're looking at the text, ask yourself, what was the author's intended meaning? And then the second question you should ask is, you know, how would the biblical audience have understood it? Because if our interpretation is way different than how the Hebrews or, or uh, the Israelites would have understood it, then we're probably missing something in the text, okay? And so, uh, but yeah, so, and this leads us to one of the most basic principles, which is we do not create the meaning, but rather we seek to dis discover the meaning that has been placed there uh, by the author. So a kind of funny way to look at this is, I mean, think about the... Uh, Literary text in America that's everywhere. The big word stop painted on oct octagonal signs, right, in the streets. Now, you can interpret that as a reader response, right, and just think that it means uh, slow down just a bit, look for cars, and then speed on through, right? <laughs> you can do that, uh, but the police, however, <laughs> strongly believe in authorial intent, right, uh, they, of the author of the laws, right? And so they will respond to your interpretation most likely with a ticket and a fine, right? And so... Uh, in the biblical context, when, we, when we're talking about an author, we're meaning both human and divine authors, right? We're meaning both. So God chose to work through human writers to deliver his message to us, and the language he chose was a human language, right? Or human languages. So in biblical interpretation, meaning is not determined by the reader. Meaning is what the author intended to communicate when he wrote the text. So that will never change. It's not subjective. It's, it's, it's something that's the same for all Christians. However, what will change is the application, right? The application is kind of like reader response. You can apply the scripture to your life in so many different areas, and we may all interpret it, or I mean apply it uh, in a different way. So I wanted to start here with the role of the Holy Spirit, because I think this is oftentimes where our minds tend to go when we talk about interpreting scripture. The first thing we think of is you know, it's kind of confusing. You know, <laughs> what, what does the Holy Spirit do when it comes to interpretation? And uh, I want to ask you guys uh, for this class just to kind of hold all your questions to the end. I know that's going to probably drive some of you crazy, but just so that we can kind of get through the material and have a good flow of thought and, and kind of build these principles build off of each other. So please hold your questions till the end. Uh, and uh, that's mainly so I don't get sidetracked as well. And, you know, if, if, you, if you're worried you're going to forget it, just write it down. Uh, and if it's, and I really would like for you to cater the questions 
to the material, to the topics that we're discovering today. If you have a question that's outside of the scope of what we're covering today, then feel free to come and ask me or email me. That's, that's totally fine. But uh, we can, I mean, there's just so many things we could cover, right? I mean, this is, like I said, just the introduction that we're getting into. So if you still have a lot of questions, uh, don't worry. I think it'll either be addressed further in the PowerPoint or in another class. So the first week, this week, we're going to cover the role of the Holy Spirit in interpreting, and we're going to cover a scary word that's, trust me, not that scary, literary analysis. Okay, sounds boring, right? <laughs> but uh, second week, we're going to cover pre-understanding, and we're going to look at uh, what do we bring to the text? What type of baggage do we bring when we come to the text? And, then we're, and that's going to be a really fun one. And then we're also going to look at, we're going to look at how to interpret the genre of either gospels or letters. And then next week, we're going to cover some other genres, whether it's uh, apocalyptic or, you know, uh, history or narrative. We're going to look at how do we interpret these different genres, and we'll get into genre and stuff later. Uh, but anyway, so, and then the last week, we'll do a five-step interpretive method. So if you come to the last week, if you make it all the way through, that's when I'll kind of share with you an easy, very easy five-step process that you can take that will really help you, uh, I mean, really help you avoid almost all the interpretive mistakes that people tend to make. And so uh, if you're still, after all this material, you're like, I still don't know what to do, don't worry, the last week we'll cover that. So let's go ahead and start moving. So when, it's not a good noise. There we go. Okay, <laughs> cool. All right, so when we talk about inspiration, right, we talk about the, the, the word of God being inspired by God, right? Um, what we mean by that word is that inspiration refers to the Holy Spirit's work in the lives of the human authors of Scripture with the result that they wrote what they wanted to communicate. You know, that's, that's, that's the big picture is that, you know, when Paul was writing, God gave him some liberty to use his own personal stories, to use some of his, his own way that he communicates when he writes Greek, because everybody writes Greek a little bit differently. <laughs> uh, but regardless of all that, the Holy Spirit was there to make sure that the main point got across, right? Uh, whatever it was that God wanted to communicate got communicated, and that can, there's some flexibility when it comes to like personal stories and personal styles. The Holy Spirit allows for that. Um, now, we get this from this verse, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Spirit breathed God's character into the scriptures. Now, illumination refers to the Spirit's ongoing work of bringing believers to understand and receive the truth of scripture. So the Spirit's work of inspiration and illumination they go hand in hand. They work together. They can't be separated. So inspiration refers to the, the work that the Holy Spirit is doing through the authors to pen what it is that they wanted the author to pen. And illumination is the process that the Holy Spirit does on the believer's heart to get him to kind of, or her, to understand the gospel truth or the message behind the, in the text. And so we're going to, don't worry, we're going to look a little bit more into this. So the question will be asked, can we grasp God's word apart from the Spirit? Yes but only to an extent. And here's what I mean by that. With valid interpretive methods, even unbelievers are able to comprehend much of the Bible, okay? But it's limited, and for three reasons. One, sin has an effect on the whole person, including the mind. Now, I'm not suggesting that sin prevents uh, a, a person from recognizing prepositional phrases or anything like that, but I do believe that sin has kind of dulled our ability to perceive and discern spiritual truths and even apply it, right? And so, we should recall how common it is for readers, I know for me especially, to let their prejudices or ideologies distort their reading, right? Distortion is a real possibility. It's something we have to, we have to guard against. And it's whenever a reader is faced with a text that requires behavior change, whenever that happens, uh, not to mention the death of the old and, and the end of self-love, like th those are big changes. There's going to be some resistance to the reader, right? When they're re reading these things that are trying to change the way they live, you're going to want to fight that a little bit. And you've got to be aware of that. That's going to maybe change your interpretation a little bit, um, and you have to guard against that. So an unbeliever's ability to understand the meaning of the biblical text is limited by the effects of their pre-understanding, the things they bring to the text. And we'll get into pre-understanding later. But uh, so since the Spirit plays a crucial role in helping Christian interpreters deal with the baggage of their pre-understanding, a person who does not have the Spirit will encounter an even greater degree of distortion. So when I said that a person without the Spirit can understand the meaning of the biblical passage only to a degree, what I mean is, is that's because understanding involves more than just taking in information, right? Understanding involves uh, the whole person, the mind, emotions, the body, and so on. 
So the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand, apply, them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So according to this verse, will people without the Spirit accept the truth of the Bible and apply it to their lives? Well, the answer is no. Paul does not mean that a person without the Spirit will have no intellectual comprehension of what the Bible is saying. Rather, what he means is that the unbeliever will understand it in the sense that the, that uh, they won't apply it to their lives and live out that truth. Uh, they'll see it as, they'll understand it, but they'll see it as foolish, or I don't want to do that, you know, and they'll reject it. And so Paul is referring here to a personal, experiential kind of understanding. They can grasp the bi- biblical text, but they won't let the text grasp them. So when it comes to biblical interpretation, the Spirit does appear to work little in the cognitive dimension, more in the area of discerning truth, and the most in application. And I think this is, uh, this is something we can all kind of relate to, is when you're reading a passage, there are sometimes it just applies to your life in a certain way, or you, you just immediately come to realize, I know how I can apply this truth in my life. It's this scenario, or this sitting, or this friend, or this challenge, right? And so the Holy Spirit works in our hearts to kind of bring up those areas in our life that this verse can be applied to this truth. So how does the Spirit work in relation to scripture. And by the way, this is uh, being recorded, so you can, if you, if I'm going too fast and you don't have enough time to write it down, I can also give you the PowerPoint if that's something that interests you. So I, I just want to make sure that you guys are present, that you can actually, you know, sometimes I have trouble writing and listening at the same time. So if that's the problem, you know, just sit back, relax, listen, and we can always send you the material. So, but uh, when it comes to biblical interpretation, having the Holy Spirit does not mean that the Spirit is all you need when it comes to interpretation. The Spirit does not make interpretation just automatic, right? Just like, I mean, I've never had that happen to me, at least maybe you have, but, and I think an illustration will help. So when a child's learning to walk, right, they usually want their parents involved in the experience, and usually the parents will sit a few feet apart, and they'll, uh, they'll point the wobbly child in the direction of the other parent with their outstretched arms, you know, and they'll kind of play catch with the child for the first few days until the child gets kind of the hang of walking. But for the sake of the illustration, what if the child thought, since my parents are here, I don't have to do anything, you know? I don't have to put one foot in front of the other or stumble backwards or fall down. With mom and dad close by, walking will just come automatically. Now, although this illustration borders on the absurd, uh, many people reason like this when they, when they think about uh, the Spirit's role in, in biblical interpretation, saying, as it were, because I am a Christian, I have the Spirit of God living within me, I don't have to do anything when it comes to under- interpreting the Bible. It'll just happen automatically, and the Spirit will help you, it will guide you, but it will not walk for you. And I think that, that illustration really helps us kind of understand the role of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the Spirit does, not, d- does expect us to use our minds. Proper inter- interpretive methods and good study helps to interpret the Bible accurately. So God gave us minds, right? And He expects us to use them. He, 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 when it comes to, to a Bible study, He wants us to think clearly. He wants us to reason soundly. Since God created us to think, study is spiritual. Uh, Our heavenly helper, the Spirit, wants to hold our hand and guide us as we walk, but he won't walk for us. So the Spirit does not uh, create new meaning or provide new information. So I think this is something that sometimes new believers uh, struggle with, but the canon of Scripture is, is closed, right? Which means that we should not expect the Spirit to author another book anytime soon. Uh, The work that he's completed is, in his opinion at least, complete, right? It has everything that we need for a solid foundation until we get to the next life, right? Or until we get uh, to the new earth and all of that stuff. And he, he believes that the foundation is there for us to cling, to have enough faith to leave. Now, obviously not every answer is in the Bible of every scenario, but the principles that are there can really help us use those principles to these different things in our life that maybe are unanswered. Um, And so the Spirit gives us a deeper understanding of the truth that's already there. It doesn't whisper new meanings in our ear. The Spirit uncovers things written, understood long ago. So, and this makes sense if you think about it. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen some pastors, uh, maybe TV evangelist or, or someone who says, I was reading this passage and the Spirit made clear to me what this verse means, a new meaning that no one's ever seen before or thought about, right? Well, that's not how the Spirit works, right? And, and there's a reason for that, because if the Spirit did work that way, he'd be disagreeing with himself, right? Because he, he wrote it to mean one thing a long time ago. Now what, he's changing his mind about how, what he meant when he wrote it? You know, so it, 
the Spirit doesn't whisper new meaning to our ears, uh, in our ears, but we can rely on the Spirit to help us grasp the meaning of God's Word that's already there, the ability to apply it. So the ability to discern the theology of the passage, not as a new revelation, but as fresh understanding of the meaning that's in the Bible. This insight from the Spirit come, may come after hours of study, which is typically the case, or it may come suddenly. So, and then also, the Spirit does not change the Bible to suit our purposes or, or match our, our circumstances. So, I think we c- this is hard for us because we can be very tempted when we're going through a challenging situation or something in our life and we're seeking the scriptures for, for some application or something in our life that sometimes we, we distort the meaning, right, of what the context is actually saying because we want it to apply to our lives, right? But the Spirit will not do that. Um, we may even find ourselves violating context as we search for that connection to the scriptures that we're reading. And this is especially easy for new believers to c- kind of confuse their own feelings with the voice of the Holy Spirit, But we can't expect the Holy Spirit to change the meaning of the Bible because the Spirit always agrees with himself. The Spirit does, however, work to transform the life of the interpreter. So I love this quote. uh, The Spirit's work in interpretation is not to change the sense, but to restore us to our our senses. So Van Hooser sees it three ways in which the Spirit works in the life of the Christian interpreter. Hope I'm talking. Am I talking loud enough? Okay. Um... The Spirit convicts us, number one, that the Bible is divinely inspired, right? We come to believe that God's Word is God's Word because of the role of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the Spirit works in the minds to impress on us the full meaning of the Scriptures. So we come to understand that a command really is a command, right? That a promise really is a promise, and so on. And we're empowered to grasp the importance of each. And number three, the Spirit works in our hearts so that we're able to receive the Word of God, the application, right? The last way relates clo- closely to what's called sanctification. So the Spirit's ongoing work in transforming our character to be like the, trans- the character of God. And san- sanctification is kind of a big word, but, you know, it's, it's really easy to understand. Like, if, if, if we're in this room and Jesus is at that door, sanctification is me getting closer to that door, right? Is getting closer to Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit helps in that regard as well. Also, our spiritual maturity does affect our ability to hear the Spirit in the Scriptures. So zealous and immature Christians may love the Lord, and they mean well, but oftentimes they do tend to come up with the most ridiculous, like, off-the-wall interpretations. I know that was true with me. Um, And that's because spiritual maturity includes learning how to listen to the divine author, right? Um, And by submitting to his word. That's kind of difficult sometimes for new believers to listen to what the author's saying, not what we want it to say, right? And to submit to it. That, that, takes, uh, that takes some maturation in our faith. So when you sit down a- with your Bible and listen to the Lord with all your heart, you're engaging in what's called a devotional reading. And this is kind of a different, we're going to switch gears here, this is kind of a different way to read Scripture. And it, it's, it's, it's a, a very important way to read Scripture. The focus is less on analyzing and studying and more on personal, intimate time of communicating with the Lord. So during such time, the Spirit uses the word to renew our souls. Both prayer and devotion reading are closely uh, related to the discipline of like meditating in Scripture. So don't think that every time you pick up your Bible that you have to do an in-depth word study or observe 50 details in the text, right? Sometimes you need to be still and you have to enter enter the living presence of God where you drink deeply of His word and respond in heartfelt worship. And one of the ways you can do this is through this ancient way of reading scripture, a, a practice that's been used for a long time, it's Lectio Divinia, and that's just the Latin for holy reading or prayerful reading. And, if you're, and we're going we're gonna to practice this here in a second of what this looks like, but it's a very, very basic, really easy way to have a devotion. If you've ever wanted to have devotions in the morning, you know, for a long time I thought devotion was the same thing as studying God's word. I didn't realize that there was like, you could have like a observation and like an analysis of the text and understanding the author's meaning. I didn't realize that that wasn't called a devotion. You know, the devotion is more, is a kind of a different practice. And so uh, we're going to get into what that looks like on this next slide. So here's the five steps of this process. So silencio, lectio, meditatio, oratio, I think I'm saying these things right, contemplatio. All right, so let's get into this. Silencio is the time that you prepare to hear God's word by slowing down. So this is crucial because Sometimes we get into God's word and we just want to get it done or we're rushing through it and or we're thinking about things that are gonna, we're going to do after or we're just got a lot on our minds and it's really hard to slow down, breathe, 
you know, still ourselves and, and get ready because we're, we're going to read God's word here. You know, like it, it's good to, to make this time a sacred time, just kind of clear out our thoughts and let's focus, you know, and that's what this, this first step in the devotion is, is just kind of slowing down, clearing your mind. Lectio is the time that you select a passage and you read it slowly and out loud. So, and then meditatio is the time where you read the passage again, but this time you pause on individual words and let it sink into your heart and mind. Oratio is the time you pray the passage, and contemplatio is the time you w- rest and wait patiently for God and for the Holy Spirit to kind of reveal the application. Uh, so you close this time typically with like prayer and thanksgiving. And so there really is no substitute for prayer when reading and interpreting and applying the Bible, so I would always strongly encourage that you pray while you read, uh, pray for clarity. And we're going to do an exercise real quick of how this looks if we're going to do this devotion. And so with this passage, so like if we were going to do this passage, we practice the first step, silencio. Clear out what we're going to do when we're going to go home. We're going to stop thinking about that delicious chili we just ate, <laughs> right? Um, and we're just going to focus. We're going to get ready because we're about to read God's word, okay? Second is lectio. So this is the time where we read the text uh, slowly and out loud. So, for God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at times. O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Tela. So now we're going to read it again, but this time we're going we're gonna to go slow. And this kind of goes way against our, like, nat- our natural instincts. Uh, and we're going to pause on these individual words and really let them sink in. And so you'd read it a little bit slower like this. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock. My refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And now we'd move into the time where we pray the passage, which I think I always love this part. I think it's so cool to do. And so we pray through this passage. We just turn it into a prayer. So you'd say, you know, oh God, you alone is, are what my soul waits for. I wait in silence, Lord, for you. For you are my hope. Ev- all my hope is from you. You are my rock. You are my salvation, my fortress. And no matter what's going in my life, I won't be shaken. On you rests my salvation and my glory. You're my mighty rock, my refuge, O oh God. I trust in you, even when all of the chaos is going around me, that you have my, my eternal life secure. And I pray that all the people around me, including myself, that we pour our hearts before you because you are a refuge for us. And then contemplatio is the time that we would wait and we just kind of think about this passage. We'd, we'd wait for God to maybe stir in our hearts, you know, some things that are going in our lives that maybe this verse is pointing out. You know, how are we not letting God be our rock? How are we not letting him be our, our fortress? You know, uh, where in my life am I not putting my hope in him? You know, and, and this is kind of that. So that's kind of like an example of how a devotion could work, uh, a very simple way to do a devotion, and I think that's a really powerful thing to do, uh, and I don't think you, you can really study God's word without doing both the devotion and kind of the analytical side of it, so. Okay, so much of this class is concerned with proper kind of inter- interpretive stuff, and I don't really make any apologies for that because these methods and procedures are needed to understand the Bible. They always will be needed. There is just no such thing as like autopilot interpretation, you know, where we just flip on a spiritual switch and God does it all for us. Um, however, I don't want you to leave with the impression that studying God's word is nothing more than application or a particular method. The interpretive task is not simply an intellectual one. It's, it involves our entire being and the help of the Holy Spirit. We must listen more intently than we even listen to our best friend. And we throw off pride and laziness 
and study diligently and submissively, not because we love studying, you know, but we study because, and we take it seriously because we love God's Word, and we love God. So in summary, what we covered with this kind of PowerPoint is that having the Holy Spirit does not mean that the Spirit is all that we need when it comes to interpretation, since He won't make biblical interpretation automatic. Uh, He expects us to use our mind, valid interpretive methods, and good study. The Spirit does not create new meaning or provide new information, but He enables us to accept the Bible as God's Word and grasp the meaning that's already there. The Spirit does not change the Bible to suit our needs or purposes or match our circumstances, but He will work in our lives as interpreters. He restores us to our senses and helps us grow spiritually so that we can hear His voice more clearly. Okay, so will the next PowerPoint just... All right, we'll just load up. Nice. So we're now going to transition to kind of literary analysis. And it kind of involves two things when we talk about literary context, but we'll get that into that in just a second. But I want to talk about the story of the, the High Mulan. Okay, so a student goes into a university, and he's a student of natural history, and he meets his professor. He's kind of touring the university, and he meets the professor, and uh, he kind of tells him, you know, what he's majoring in. Uh, he wants to major in zoology, and he's kind of interested in all areas, right? And the professor asks him, where do you want to begin, or when do you want to begin? Now, he replies, this seems to please the professor, right? And so they begin. She, she reaches for a specimen jar with yellow alcohol, this ugly fish in there, right? She gives him this, uh, this, this specimen to look at, and the professor says, take this fish, we call it a high mulan, and I w- don't want you to use any microscopes or anything like that, just use your eyes, okay? And she leaves, and then she says, I'm going to return in a while, just, you know, study it, and, and I'll come back and see what you got. So the student... <laughs> takes the nasty fish out, right, looks at it, starts making all little, the analogies that, or I mean the, the details that they can note. And after about 10 minutes, the student's like, you know, I think I've seen everything I can see in this fish. <laughs> and so he looks for the professor, but finds that the professor's gone. The professor's left the campus and will be back for a few hours. So he returns back to the fish, starts studying it, finds a few more things. And after the professor returns, uh, he lists some of the things that, you know, he's found. And the professor seems disappointed, you know, uh, good, those are some good things, but uh, you've missed the most obvious feature, you know, look, look, look some more. So he looks some more, the professor leaves, professor comes back, and so he starts listing off some of the things, fringe gill arches, fleshy lips, lidless eyes, a lateral line, you know, stuff like that, and good, 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 the professor says, but still disappointed, and says he misses the most obvious feature. So she says, you know what, take the fish home, and study it some more. The student's starting to regret his decision to start his education early at this point. And he takes the fish home, but it's still just as ugly as it is in the lab, as it is home, from every direction. And he returns the next morning, eager to share what he thinks is the obvious feature that he missed. Is the obvious feature that it has symmetrical sides with paired organs? The student asks, that's a good one, that's good, no. But you still miss the most obvious detail. The obvious detail that you're missing is that the fish, my dear boy, is dead. (laughs) You know? But there's still so much more, the professor says. Look, 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 and keep observing. So the lesson that the student learned may seem a little bit silly, but it's one of the most powerful lessons the student did ever learn. This is a real story. Uh, Is that we're so often quick to look and just think that we've seen everything that there is to see. I mean, do you see the similarity between that and studying God's Word? Uh, So one of the things that I love to to challenge students with is that you know, when we come to a text, before we jump into the commentaries and the atlases and, and the Greek or the Hebrew translations, make all the observations you can, you know, uh, just with your own eyes and a pencil. And so some of these observations that you're going to make are repetition of words, contrast, comparisons, list, cause and effect, figures of speech, conjunctions, verbs, pronouns, questions and answers, dialogue, you know, who's talking here, who are they talking to, uh, conditional clauses, Actions of, and roles of God, you know, like king or redeemer, uh, or the roles of people, prophet, or, or just uh, someone in the audience. Emotional terms, you know, is, the, is this charged with emotion? Uh, or the tone of the passage, is Paul and his letter being, is he angry, right? Is he happy? Is he encouraging? Make note of that. Um, study the words in the text and look for parallel passages. So when you get done, what started out as a small verse may start to look like this, Right? <laughs> And uh, you'll start to realize, man, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot maybe I missed when I first came and just read it one through in, in 10 seconds and then moved on, right? Uh, and so slowing down and using the power observation, I think, is, is really the first kind of step uh, you should begin at. And then next we can kind of work into the context. So literary context involves two things. 
the surrounding context, and genre. And we're going we're gonna to look at both of those today. And so imagine you're a college student strolling to class one day and you hear a total stranger say, go for it. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> You know, uh, what you can th- is that guy one fry short of a Happy Meal? Or, you know, do you think maybe this guy just spoke to me? I was, you know, I, I was in a, in a pickle over a dating dilemma. Thanks, go for it. I'm going to ask her out, you know. <laughs> well, how would you? No, you most likely wouldn't react that way. You'd most likely ask a few questions like, go for what? <laughs> right? Uh, or what exactly did you mean when you said that? Now, unfortunately, we don't have the authors here today to ask them, what did you mean? <laughs> you know, but what we, luckily what we do have is we have literary genre. And so uh, I would say that one of the most important in biblical interpretations we have when, when, uh, is that context determines meaning, right? We have to look at the context. And the sermon that I gave today kind of showed the dangers if we do that. Because if otherwise, we can, we can take scripture to just mean almost anything, right? Um, so what is literary context? So this relates to the particular form of passage takes and the words, the sentences, the paragraphs that surround the passage that we're studying. So I said it involves two things. Here's the first. So genre. Most of us are familiar with genre when we think of music, right? Like jazz or, or rock or something like that. Uh, but it's a French word, and it just simply means form or kind. And before we jump into the, the surrounding passages that come before and after, we have to notice genre. And I, I'm going to tell you guys this. This is so important because genre... Uh, John refers to like different categories of literature in the Bible. And so like in the Old Testament, these are the main genres that you'll find. You'll find narrative, law, poetry, prophecy, wisdom. And so, uh, man, I'll try to think of it. Law would be like Leviticus. Poetry would be Psalms. Wisdom literature would be, uh, so, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I think Job. And maybe Songs of Solomon? Proverbs, definitely, yeah. So maybe not Songs of Solomon. I'm not for sure on that one. But uh, we're not going to cover all of these in the class, but this is all covered in the book, the different genres. And in the New Testament, we have Gospel, uh, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have History, like the Book of Acts. We have Apocalyptic, like Revelation. And we have the Letters, which uh, are like all mostly written by Paul. And so these genres, uh, it really helps us to think about these um, And like a kind of like a sports analogy, I think helps. I mean, think for for a moment of a European soccer fan who's attending his first American football and basketball games. If he doesn't know the rules of the sport, it's gonna be really hard for him to understand what's going on, right? In football, the offensive and defensive players can use their hands to push their opponents. In basketball and soccer, they cannot. In basketball, players cannot kick the ball, but they can hold it in their hands. In soccer, the reverse is true, right? In football, everyone can hold the ball with their hands, but only one person can kick, right? And so these rules are important because otherwise, if you're watching this, you're going to be very confused of what's going on. And so the author has kind of played the game when he's writing. We may not be able to there to ask him exactly what he means. He's used these genres as like a set of rules, like sports rules or like music. Like, you know, if someone was playing the same beat that a jazz song has for a country song or the same instruments, it might be a little weird, right? Uh, But uh, so... We can know what the author is trying to mean a lot of times by the genre. And each genre has their own set of rules. So letters have their own rules. Gospel has their own rules. And so before we even jump into the context, we have to recognize first, what genre am I reading? And what are the special little rules that go with that genre? And this can help us kind of crack the code of what the author, because the author knows he's playing by these same rules. These were common literature things that were going on during his time. And so for most of us... um, you know, th- it kind of acts like a covenant of communication. Uh, and so if you stop and think about it, we're constantly encountering different genres when we read, right? In the course of an ordinary day, uh, we might read from a newspaper, look up a number in the phone directory. We don't do that anymore. What am I saying? <laughs> no one has a phone directory anymore. Uh, we may order from a menu, uh, reflect on a poem, enjoy a love letter, uh, wade through instructions on how to get to a friend's house, or meditate on a devotional book, Right? When you meet these different genres, you know, whether consciously or not, you're playing by these certain rules of communication, right? You wouldn't want to put a metaphor in a menu. Be weird, right? You wouldn't want to put a tip percentage chart in a love letter, right? (laughs) It just wouldn't make much sense, right? So you run the dangerous risk if you're to confuse a telephone directory with a love letter, right? Uh, So we know this because these these various genres, they they evoke certain interpretive expectations on the reader. So uh, definitely consider genre whenever we're interpreting. 
Next is the surrounding context. This is the other part that I was talking about. So this is just simply the passages that, that surround the text that we're studying. So this is the words and sentences and paragraphs and discourses. That's just a longer word for more than one paragraph uh, that come before and after the passage. So, man, that's really small. Okay, it's better over here. Not so good up there. <laughs> so the diagram above shows concentric circles that create the surrounding context of the passage. So we have the passage, then we have the immediate context, so that's what's right before and after. The rest of the larger section, so the paragraphs before and after. The rest of the book, and then the rest of the Bible. So in biblical interpretation, the highest priority should be placed on the immediate context, right? What comes right before and right after the passage. And the general rule is the closer, to th the, closer the circle is to the center, the greater influence it has on the meaning of your passage. So after you look at the immediate context, ask yourself, well, okay, how do the paragraphs before that and after it, how does that flow into it, right? And then, how does this fit in the, in the grand scheme of the book, right, that he's writing? And then, how does that book fit in where it's placed in the Bible, right? What is it, what is it why is it there and, and, and stuff like that? So, and in that time period written in this time period. Written. So, uh, here's some dangers about ignoring uh, literary context is, you know, Anytime an individual ignores or focuses on a single verse without paying attention to the surrounding verses, uh, you run into a huge risk. And we can see this from a few of these verses right here. Um, Revelation. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they, and they with me. So commonly that verse is kind of read as like an evangelistic promise, right? That, uh, that anyone who might accept Lord and the Lord, uh, as Jesus says, their Lord and Savior. However, in context, if you read this stuff before and after it, you'll find out that this is actually a promise given to a congregation of lukewarm Christians, right? Jesus is waiting to renew fellowship with them if they repent. So that kind of changes a little bit. You know, maybe it's not an evangelistic promise to, I mean, Jesus obviously is here, and, and he, he will respond if you come to him. But this is, this passage is not talking about that, right? It's talking, it's a message to lukewarm Christians. Uh, and so if you're a lukewarm Chris, Christian, then maybe this is more relevant to you, you know, that, hey, if you turn back, he's right there, you know? And so another one is, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from the pure heart. So this verse uh, is kind of like a favorite verse for fighting off sexual temptation. But how does the surrounding context define evil desires of the youth, right? What's being talked about here in this passage? Well, Paul is writing to Timothy, who's facing problems of false teachers within leadership of the church at Ephesus. In the previous unit, chapter 2, verses 14 through 19, it makes clear that Timothy must resist false teachers. So in verse 22, Paul tells Timothy to run away from foolish, dis foolish discussions, arguments, and theological novelties so attractive to young ministers an example, evil desires of youth, and run instead after righteousness, faith, love, peace with the true people of God. So much to the surprise of some, this verse actually has little, if anything, to do with sexual temptation, right? Uh, so that's just a, a few more examples from that, you know, that how, why context matters. Another one uh, is if you proof texting, it's kind of like when you take, it's kind of like what we just covered, but instead of taking one verse, it's like a part of a verse. Right? And that, that can get real crazy because you can take Psalms 14.1, just take a part of it and say, there is no God. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, it's right there in the Word of God. It says it. Look. Yeah, well, what's the context of that, right? Uh, or you could get it, you could cut it out to say this, Judas went out and hanged himself. Go and do likewise. What you do, do quickly. <laughs> yeah, not, not, don't advise that, right? So that's just kind of like, you know, another example. But another danger is topical preaching. Now, there's nothing wrong with topical preaching at all, especially when topical preaching is done right. Whenever the preacher is taking the, uh, the, the original verse that he's pulling from in its proper context. So typically, in the, the first one, John 10, that's how topical preaching should work, right? You've got, you're following along in a passage and you're following the author's thought process. You've got thought one, thought two, thought three, thought four, the final connection, and then uh, the preacher's sermon, okay? But in topical preaching, uh, he may pull a verse from John 10, that's, you know, the first thought, and then he may go to Psalms 23 in the third of the paragraph, in the third thought of the, of the author, and then back to Acts, and to make his point, to make his sermon. You can see the danger in this, how it can be very easy to take these out of context. Uh, so, like, let's say we're doing a topical lesson on love, 
right? I can go and look at all the places where love is mentioned in the Bible. And I can, oh, I like that one, I like this one, you know, and I'll put them all together and then I can make my point. That can be dangerous if you're not considering the context, right? Make sure that, that you study each individual context of that verse before you do that. And that's just kind of a, something I, I like to warn people about that, that, that teach on topical things. It was a very popular way to preach nowadays. A lot of people use topical, you know, if you're studying, you know, anything really. They, they look at all the verses, you know, but you have to be careful that you take each verse in its context. Spiritualizing the text. So, um... I think the best way to think about this is, imagine we're doing a Bible study right now over a passage. Uh, let's say, if you guys have your Bibles, you can turn and follow along if you'd like uh, to Luke chapter, I think it's 15, uh, verse, or no, it's chapter 8, sorry. Nope, it's 15, 8 through 10. It's the parable of the lost coin. You can type that in too if that's getting you confused. Uh, I'll give you a few seconds just to get there. So we're going to cover the parable of the lost coin. If it's not 15, let me know. I, I didn't include the verse in my notes, so... I think it's Luke 15, 8 through 10, but I'm not sure on that. It's the parable of the lost coin. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, so let's read. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. So let's say we're doing, uh, and we'll get into how to interpret parables at a later uh, class, but let's say we're doing a Bible study, and I'm going to use real names here of people just to make it fun. So, okay, so let's say Melinda says, okay, so what do you think this passage means? I don't know, uh, or I asked Melinda, what do you think this passage means? And she says, I don't know, she says. But my Bible study says that houses those days had low roofs and few windows, so it's hard to see in there. That's why she needed the lamp. Then Cindy says, yeah, and she has to sweep the house because it's, dir- it's dirty. So we have a dark, dirty house with not much light. I think that's like the world, you know what I mean? When we drift into the world, it's like being that coin, not being able to see clearly, lost in the dark and in the dirt, unable to see Jesus. So the house stands for the world, and we're the coin when we backslide. Jesus, of course, is the one who comes in and looks for us and finds us in the dark. Melinda thinks that makes pretty good sense and is impressed with Cindy's response. Good job, Cindy. <laughs> So you're saying Jesus is a woman, objects George? I can't go for that. It's a, par- <laughs> it's a parable, Melinda says. It doesn't matter if they portray Jesus as a woman. Then Clint chimes in and says, Melinda, I never thought of the house as referring to the world. When I think of a dark place where people can get lost, I think of the church today. I mean, just look at all the churches today that are not really following Jesus and just preaching psychology and stuff. The church really needs the light of the gospel today. And remember all those early churches? Weren't those house churches? But then what would the coin be, asked Cindy. Well, Melinda responds, maybe the coin represents the true faithful congregation that just seems to get lost in the midst of all these other churches who don't know what's going on. At least, that's the way it looks for me. And then Clint adds, maybe the woman in the story represents the pastor of the true church, and she is sweeping out all of, all of this false doctrines to find the true believers. George then jumps in, I think it's not the church, but our hearts that are dark and dirty. Jesus comes in and cleans them by sweeping out the sin. And look, my Bible, Bible even says that the brooms they used back then were made of s- numerous two-foot bundles of straw. Wow, you know, like one straw can't do anything, but when they're bundled together, they're really strong. Uh, it's kind of like the Bible, and the Bible is composed of multiple individual books, but when bundled together, it's really strong. Right now, Dave just sees the text and is thinking, wow, I wish I could see something deep and spiritual like them, but I can't. And now he's confused. Can the house refer to all of these things? So this is called spiritualizing the text. Did you notice how completely different all the various interpretations were in the story above? The members of the story felt free to develop whatever the meaning they wanted. None of them seemed concerned to determine what Jesus intended when he spoke the words or what Luke intended when he wrote down the episode under the guidance of the Spirit. Additionally, none of these Bible study participants seemed to notice the context of the story, right? The preceding story right before this is the story of the parable of the shepherd uh, who loses one sheep and leaves the other 99 to find it and then rejoices. The story after this parable of the coin is the story of the parable of the lost son, in which the father rejoices when his lost son returns. So these, all these parables, they're put together in this order for a reason. The author's trying to make a point. Uh, And speak of the, it's to speak of the joy that God feels when someone who is lost comes to faith and is saved. It also stresses God's concern over the lost to show the effort he exerts to find and restore that which is lost. 
And if you actually pay attention to the verse we just read uh, in that par- uh, the parable of the lost coin, the last verse even tells us this, right? We don't have to determine what the coin is and what's going on here because the last verse states that in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angel uh, of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus is not using the house to represent anything specific in our lives. He's simply just making a comparison. And uh, the woman is concerned over losing the coin because the coin's important to her, and God feels the same way towards us. The woman goes to great lengths to find the coin because God likewise goes to great lengths. She rejoices because God rejoices. This seems to be the meaning intended by the author. So remember, we do not seek to create the meaning, but to find the one that's already there. The students, however, or the participants in our, uh, the na- names that I mentioned earlier, missed the obvious meaning in the text because they wanted to find some deep spiritual meaning, right? Their desire to find this deep spiritual meaning drove them right past the author's intended meaning. So, which is Christ searches for the lost and rejoices when they're found. Uh, this is what uh, spiritualizing means. However, it's communicated through uh, grammar, context, and so on. It's not created by the whims of our imagination. The Bible is already a spiritual book dealing with spiritual issues. We don't have to spiritualize it anymore with our imaginations. So there's another kind of form of this, which is called allegorical interpretation. And it's kind of, kind of similar. It kind of deals with symbols, you know, where everything's a symbol. And look, this symbol means this and this is connected to that. And people get wrapped up in all that. And, and that's dangerous because then you're playing reader response, where you're determining the meaning of the text. You're completely ignoring what the author was trying to write and nobody, I mean, you wouldn't want that to happen to you, right? If I wrote a book or something, I wouldn't want someone to be like just, you know, oh yeah, these are all symbols and who cares what Austin was writing? <laughs> you know, that, that would be ridiculous. So, uh, uh, and so yeah, anyway, I, I'm not going to get into allegorical interpretation, but that's in the book as well if you want to read that. So, um, so how do we identify the surrounding context? Where is it? There we go. To identify the surrounding context, you must see how the sentences fit together as a book in order to communicate the larger message. So, we may not have the author here today to question, but we can trace his thought as it flows through each sentence and paragraph. So knowing the surrounding context will answer these questions. What is this unit's role or function and the purpose in the book? What would happen if we removed this section from the book? Why did the author include this section as a crucial part of the whole? So these things will kind of, if you, if you ask these questions, these will kind of uh, you know, flush out the answer. And then uh, these three steps will help you identify the surrounding context. First, identify how the book is divided into paragraphs and sections. It's actually something that I didn't realize uh, for a long time is that the paragraphs and the chapters and the way it's divided, it's not, that's not inspired. That's actually, if you go to different translations in the Bible, if we had like a big chart up here of the King James Version and all these different versions, you'd see they divide it differently. Some people include certain text in one chapter, some break it off there and then start another one, you know, the, and some divide even verses, you know, but, but that's not Holy Spirit inspired. That was added much later, and there's, there's, some, there's a flexibility in that, and so one of the things you want to kind of look at is, one, how is it divided? How does that change when you look at other in- translations? How are other translations kind of grouping these together? So that'll help you, to, that'll help you understand. Uh, if you want to do this on your own, you can even take each little section and kind of summarize it. What's the main point here? What's the main point here? What's the main point here? And as you move down, that'll help you stay consistent with the surrounding context. Then you can summarize the main idea of each section, so that, like I just said, uh, and then lastly, explain how that passage relates to the surrounding section. So why is that there? What is that, what is this verse referring to the, the one before it? You know, if the verse starts out with therefore, ask yourself why, what is that therefore, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, or if, uh, so yeah, sometimes the, the, when you see therefore at the start of a verse, you have to kind of go back and look, okay, why, what, it, what the, he's concluding something here. What is this based off of? Um, so that will help you find uh, the surrounding context. So principles for determining context. Interpret single verses in light of their immediate context, so what's before and after them. Interpret paragraphs in light of paragraphs and events around them. Determine why your text belongs where it is. Look for themes, right, and that introduce the entire section. So, you know, is it starting out with a greeting or a prayer or a benediction or something like that? Uh, Look for repeated words or phrases. You know, that's very important. If the author is repeating something over and over and over again, he's probably trying to, that's probably pretty important. (laughs) Uh, Locate the text in the purpose of its section and the purpose of the book. So why is this text there and, and what's its purpose and how does that fit with the purpose of the book or the letter? So to close all this out in summary, when we study literary context, we study it because 
the interpretation that bets best fits the context is the most valid interpretation, right? When we disregard literary context, we run the risk of forcing the Bible to say what we want it to say, and this may appear to satisfy our immediate needs, uh, but ultimately this approach hurts people by robbing them of God's liberating truth. People are seeking time-tested answers to problems that they're staring them in the face, answers that contemporary culture simply cannot supply. And when we take literary context seriously, we're taking, uh, we're saying we want to hear what God is trying to say to us. Today, we covered literary context consists of both literary genre and literary surrounding context, uh, and that genre acts like a covenant of communication between the author and the reader. As readers, it's our job to be faithful to this covenant by playing by the game's rules established by the author. The surrounding context shows us that every passage lives in a world surrounded by other passages. We ourselves communicate by connecting our words, sentences, and paragraphs into a coherent message, and the Bible does the same. We looked at some of the most common dangers associated with disregarding literary context. I hope this first section of the class has been fruitful for you. I'll now, we'll now move into kind of like a time of fielding questions, but again, just for the sake of brevity, uh, please just keep them centered on the topics that we cover today. Most likely, I might, I'll, I'll hopefully answer some of these other questions in other lessons. And, uh, and if uh, you do have a question that you don't want to voice here, you know, just find me after class and you can ask those. So uh, do we have any questions for today over the material that we covered? Topical, okay. And you said it started to be a Bible study group for our church. Mm -hmm. But are there times that you can pull out sections from other from another form of it? Yep. Yeah, there is absolutely nothing wrong with topical preaching as long as when you're pulling those sections from other parts of the Bible, you're keeping them in their context. So if you're gonna pull something from Psalms, like a random verse in Psalms, Make sure that you read the surrounding context and you don't just like, ooh, I like that point, I like this point, and you string them together when that maybe that verse wasn't a good verse to use because it was actually talking about something else, you know? So yeah, but topical preaching is a very popular, very good way to do it. It's just you run that danger of when you're, when you're kind of cherry-picking verses, you know, to do that, so. Good question. Any other? You have a question? Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, yeah, you, yeah, you know, something sounds nice, looks nice, and then uh, maybe not be at all what the author was intending, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions? Like I said, if you have other ones, we can always ask them to me when, when this is over, but uh, next week we're going to talk about pre-understanding, and that, that is such a fun one because, you know, we have our biases that we bring to the text. There's so many things that affect uh, kind of shape our worldview, and we're going to look at some of these common things that we kind of, even from, from art, from, from shows, things that have jaded the way we view stuff, and I think that's going to be a really powerful one, so. Okay, if uh, we don't have any other questions, I'll go ahead and pray us out. Thank you guys for coming, and I hope this was good for you, and again, if you want to, if, you li if you're liking this material, please buy the book. There's, there's a lot more to go off of, and, and so, okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I thank you so much for these people who have gathered to just study your word. Lord, I pray that uh, the Holy Spirit works in all of our lives today to, to apply these truths, these methods to our study so that we can better reach a lost and dying world. Lord, I pray that you give us grace uh, for the times when we've mishandled your word, Lord, whenever we've meant well, but we just didn't have the knowledge of, of how these, these things work, Lord. And I just pray that uh, you can help us to see this, the seriousness how important this is. And I pray that we can take this into our homes, into our families, and, and that when people ask us questions or people throw a random verse out, uh, that we can show them the joy of reading something in context, Lord, and that we can rebuke them not out of hate, not out of arrogance, not in a demeaning way, Lord, but in a way that's just humble and loving and just wanting to find the truth of what you're communicating to us. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs>